So is everyone up for a bit of fun today? Good, because uh, I, think, I think we'll in, enjoy ourselves today. Our idea is that this would be a real community time, a time of participation. I'm like dumb. And, um, you know, that uh, everyone will get involved and have some fun together. So, uh, yeah, so Zach, I want to give it, this is Zach Gutierrez. Give him a big uh, Hi everyone. hand. Hi. <laughs> All right, we'll start with our community prayer. You can stay seated and we'll just say this thing out loud together. May the God who is community be with us as we seek to be a community. May God bless our dreams and may God shout our dreams. May God help us to be real and to find depth in weakness and brokenness. May God help us to face and go through conflict rather than pretend by being nice. May we look at each other through the soft eyes of respect and compassion rather than the hard eyes of criticism and condemnation. May God help us let go of control and the need to fix one another. May God help us discover that we are needy in our own souls and give attention to our own hearts. May God shape us to be his people until we resemble Christ, who is full of mercy toward the wicked and the ungrateful. Amen. Wow, what a gnarly prayer, eh, guys? <laughs> Think about actually living that and walking that out every week. That's amazing. Um, okay, I'm so excited to be doing this. Last week, maybe two weeks ago, we talked about this idea of, um, of dreams and, wa and, and, and I think Joel, I can't remember if it was Joel or Graham, invited people up to kind of talk about some things they wanted to accomplish. And I, I've been drumming all my life. I've been drumming since I was about three years old. And my dad was a drummer and I wanted to be just like him. And so, you know, I started drumming at a very young age. And I run a drum academy in town here. And I realized that I, I wanted to start running drum circles because I only do private lessons and I only get to see people one at a time and I wanted to start seeing more people enjoying this idea because whether you believe it about yourself or not, we're all very rhythmic. Everyone has a heartbeat inside of them from the day you were born. Whether it was beating really strong or whether there were issues, it was there and you're all here because of that. And I believe that that's something incredible that people took, you know, however many years ago, thousands, millions of years ago, whatever, and took that heartbeat and turned it into a drum beat and we started doing that. It's the first instrument ever. And so it just fascinates me. I'm such a drum nerd about that. And one of the first things I thought of with running a drum circle is, well, there's three different kinds of drum circles that exist. We have a community drum circle. We have a, 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 a culturally focused drum circle. That means that we would all learn a piece, and then we'd all come perform it, and that's pretty cool. And then the other one's an anarchist drum circle. You can guess what that means. Just chaos. We're hopefully going to not do that today. But I'm hoping to create a new one, which is the Sunday morning drum circle, which is where we collectively get to jam together and do something that we don't normally get to do. In our culture, we're very subdued in church. I don't know if you've noticed this, but we're all kind of, I believe in Jesus. Everything's very like subdued, it seems. And there's a couple of you that are big and, sh you know, and shouting it out and stuff. But today, instead of using your voice, we get to do something else. Instead of internalizing it, we get to use our hands and we get to use our bodies instead, yeah. So there's a couple of rules to this so that it goes well. I don't want to do, take too many rules because all of a sudden it takes it away from Sunday worship and more into like this thing we have to try to follow. I want you to have fun and be free to do what you want. But if you keep your eyes on me, I'm going to give you a couple of cues and that's going to make it a little bit fun and we can orchestrate it. The word orchestration just means to add some order to a little bit of the chaos. So, if you have a shaker in your hand, shake it. If you have a tambourine in your hand, shake the tambourine. There's a, there's a difference between the two. So we got shakers. Let me hear the shakers. Yeah, good. And then let me hear a tambourine. Good. If you don't have anything, raise your hand. If you're feeling uncomfortable now, are you sure you don't want anything? Because at some point, I'm gonna I feel like you're going to be like, Maybe I do want something. Okay, okay. If you want something, Joel's going to come pass it out. If you really don't want anything, we're going to clap, and you guys are going to be my clappers, okay? Yeah, yeah. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to shame you a little bit if you don't have one. Just kidding. So. I don't know. It's kind of falling off a bit. So I mentioned a few rules that we have, a few things, a few guidelines. I'll call them guidelines. This mic. Oh, forget it. All right. So a few guidelines are 
that I want you to be present and in the room with everybody. I want you to be here in the moment. That means if you have a cell phone, oh, dude, you can either shut that thing right off or put it on airplane mode or something. Be in the room. I notice, oh, thanks, thanks, Don. I notice a lot of times our phones are like appendages and we're kind of like checking them every once in a while to see what's going on. And I would love it if one of my challenges to this church is to be a church that leaves their phones at home when they come to church. I think that would be so cool. Thanks, Dylan. That's better? Yeah. All right, sure. Dylan's my, uh, my guy. Okay, that's rule number one. Be present, be in the moment. The next rule is... That's okay. Oh, on my nose? Mm, yep, that works. Britney Spears seems to have a way easier time than this than I have. It's just not... I might switch to a mic later. Okay. God. So. <laughs> it is what it is. Okay. If I hold a shaker up, if I hold a shaker up, that means I want all the shaker's attention. If I hold a tambourine up, it means I want all the tambourine's attention, okay? If I do this, it means everybody stops what they're doing. If I go like this, it means play quieter. If I go like this, it means play louder. That's it. Good? If I happen to say something like rumble, the word rumble in a drum circle means go crazy. Just lose it. You can go crazy. In fact, let's test the rumble. Are you guys ready for the rumble? Three, two, one, rumble, go! Rumble! You guys ready to have some fun? All right, let's worship the Lord together. You guys are going to start. Everybody stand up. You got a shaker in your hand. Clap your hands. Look at this. I see you guys. Uh, yeah, there you go. There's the hand. Good. Let's do it. Shakers too. I believe in heaven. Good. I believe in hell. I believe in a holy nation with a story.
I'm definitely getting a new mic. It's nice seeing the kids there at the front. You're doing so good there. Brilliant. Did you make some of those shakers yourselves? Yes. They're so cool. Brilliant. Really good. I did notice there's a newly married couple in the place today. Aaron and Jenna just got back from their honeymoon over there. Bless their heart. Beautiful. All right. Okay. Okay, so we got a new song. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It's, uh, it's called Old Church Choir by Zach Williams. So we're actually, as the, as the Metro Percussion Choir in the audience, we're going to start us off. Hmm, let me think of it, yeah? Okay, so I want everyone to put your hands together with your percussion instruments, but this tempo, good, keep it up. Very good. I need a stand. No, that's okay. Good. Now, if you happen to have a drum in the audience, if you happen to have a djembe or a drum, I want to hear those djembes. This is very much like the body of Christ. We're all one body with many parts. And it doesn't sound any more beautiful when everyone's just all together like this. This is great. Awesome. If you got free hands, go ahead and clap. 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 Beautiful.
stops like this. song we should do that again another time yeah <laughs> awesome okay what's next room? this is the last song we'll do with the percussion for today so listen i want to thank you for getting out of your shell with me i want to thank you so much for this opportunity to be able to do this all of you this really feels wonderful you're awesome Bless him be the man, the land that is plentiful, the streams of abundance flow. Bless him be the man. Bless him be the man that found in the desert plain. I walk through the wind. Every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to you, breathe. When the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, Blessing be the name of the Lord. Blessing be the name. Blessing be the name of the Lord. Blessing be a glory. You do you with that shaker. You do you with that tambourine. Let's hear it. Yeah. Bring it down real low. Real low. Real low. Blessing be the name when the sun shining down on me. When the world's all that it should be. Blessing be your name. Even lower, even lower. Blessing be your name on the road. My great suffering and this pain can be offering. Blessing be your name. Every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to. 
Come on, let's hear it. Come on. Let's hear those voices again as loud as you can. Unashamed. Go ahead. rumble you've ever heard in your life. I want to hear percussion. I want to hear voices. There's an inner barbarian in each of you. I hear, I, can, I just know it. I just know it. Especially the Sabangas at the back of the room. I know there's lots in there. You guys ready? Here we go. Big rumble. Two, three, go! Give Zach a big hand. That was fantastic, Zach. Really was. And if you if you love drums and drum circles and all that, tomorrow evening here, Monday night, Zach is going to be doing a drum circle here with uh, other drums as well. So you're welcome to come. 7.30 tomorrow night. Let's just pray for Joel as he comes and shares the word with us, shall we? So thank you, Father, for the, uh, the joy that we've had just uh, worshiping you and uh, being able to be involved like this. We ask for your blessing on Joel now as he shares. I know he's worked hard to uh, put this together, and we just ask for your spirit to be with us and uh, help us to be attentive and receptive to your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Over to you, man. Amen. All right. That was real good. Okay. Um, yeah, you guys can just sort of keep your instruments right now, and if I say something you like, you can just shake them. I'm just kidding, that would be, that's just a bit too much, a bit too early. Anyways, when you leave, you can put them in the buckets um, as you go back, and uh, you know, it's, this is such a beautiful day, hey? Like, it's summer, this feels good. For those of you online, hello, hello, mom. <laughs> I told her I would do that. Um, and yeah, there you go, Thank, and hi, Al. <laughs> um, it's almost summer, and for those of you guys who, uh, who know, like, how many of you guys have been to Bible camp growing up? Bible camp? It was like the highlight of my whole life, Bible camp. So if you don't have your kids registered yet, um, Maple Springs is a camp that's near and dear to our heart. And this is Mark and Chelsea. Can you guys, it's Mark and Chelsea. Maybe stand up so people can see you. Yeah. <laughs> they run Maple Springs Bible Camp. If you um, are thinking, I need to send my kids, they're even so, uh, we talked about this before, that, that cost is not even an issue. So if you can't afford to send your kids, talk to them. They'll let anybody go for free. But don't swindle them. They're very, very susceptible to swindling. Um, and perhaps you think um, you could be a leader at camp. 
They need some more leaders, and, uh, and it's just a really awesome way to spend your summer, so you can check that out. Um, Percussion Sunday is pretty fun. This Friday, we're having more music in here as well. It's going to be slightly different, a bit classier, uh, maybe I'd, I'd describe it that way. It's the chamber, um, Okanagan chamber music is going to be in here. And, uh, and what we're hoping for is to just fill this space, just totally jam it full. Um, it's a really classy night, so maybe like a date night, and then you could like go for a walk downtown or go for lunch or supper, I'm sorry, supper before, and then come. You see what I'm saying? Um, right now, there's about like 75 people registered. We're hoping for about 200, and all of the money raised goes to Metro, so you should come. <laughs> we need the money. <laughs> And you need fun and culture in your, in your life, right? You can, like, Instagram it and be, like, you with a guy with a giant cello. I don't know. Harp? I don't know what's going to be here. Anyways, come. Um, it's going to be wonderful. God made all of this for us to enjoy. Last Saturday, um, Aaron and Jenna's wedding was hilarious. The whole dance floor was full of ords. Micah was my favorite. He's, he's got his crutches, right? And he's got one crutch in the air, and he's just like mouthing every word of every song, and just, it was absolutely incredible. But this is how God created us, to enjoy life and to thrive. Listen to this passage. So King David is a worship leader. Isn't that cool? Listen to what he says. Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Burst into jubilant song with music. Make music to the Lord with the harp, with the harp and the sound of singing, with trumpets and the blast of the ram's horn. Shout for joy before the Lord the King. Ram's horn. Graham. Can we get one of those? Wouldn't that be so awesome? A ram horn? Anyways, it says burst into jubilation. Isn't that cool? Shout for joy. God desires for us to flourish. This is, like, we need to know that straight away. The Christian life, the desire that God has for us, is jubilation. It's not this sense of, it's not a funeral, it's a, it's a celebration. Sometimes we think that, you know, like when you're praying, we get this idea that this prayer posture is one that's always just, like, so sad and And sometimes it's really appropriate, and other times it's just running through the hills. I don't know. It's beautiful sometimes. Listen to what else David says. May the Lord cause you to flourish, both you and your children. May you be blessed by the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. Jesus says it have come that you would have life that is abundant. This is his goal for us at the end of the day. And so I think we need that baseline to sort of understand this passage today. We're going to be going to some, um, into a really interesting passage. Sometimes these ideas of being jubilant rings hollow, doesn't it? When life is hard or, or like probably in this cultural moment, I think a lot of us feel like that would be so good. I would love to be jubilant. And we feel jubilant sometimes, but, but lots of times there's external circumstance that just like, as soon as you're done being jubilant, it just rushes back into your brain, and it's a challenge. And researcher Billy Glasner wrote this book called The Culture of Fear. Really fascinating book. This is what he said. We live in arguably the safest time and place in human history, and yet fear levels are at the highest. The Barna Group just did a massive study, and they, they um, studied 15,000 people on just wellness. That's all it was supposed to be about. And they wanted to see how people are doing. Um, And this was actually pre-pandemic. And what they found astounded them. They found that nearly every single person in the study was dealing with some level of anxiety in their life. And they actually renamed the study Life in the Anxious Age. Sociologists are sort of calling this the anxious age. And they're not exactly sure how we got here. There's so many theories from many options for things like occupations or even at the grocery store to screens to our our, our 24-7 media circle. Like there's so many different reasons for this. They're not exactly sure. But we do know that we're in this stage. So out of that Barna Group study, David Kinnaman says this, anxiety blankets our society and our lives with a thick, wet, bone-chilling fog. 
And I just see that as such a contrast between what God would have for us. And it's so hard to know how to get there. And we can't just will ourselves. We can't wake up in the morning and be like, okay, today I'm going to be happy. It doesn't just happen. It doesn't just, it's not just a decision that can quickly be made. So we're going to get into this text pretty soon, but why don't we open in a word of prayer? Why don't you all just where you're sitting, just ask the spirit to come and inform you. And then I will pray for all of us together. Yeah, Jesus, fill us with your spirit. What an incredible promise. You said that you are going to the Father, but you are sending the counselor to come and lead us into freedom. We receive that promise right now. We receive it. I ask that you'd fill us individually and corporately, Jesus. Thank you. Amen. Well, right in the middle of the civil rights movement, it was January 27th, 1956, and Martin Luther King Jr. received a phone call. And this phone call was of a man who was yelling on the other end of the phone. He said, listen, and then use an expletive, we're tired of you and your mess. If you ain't out of this town in three days, we are gonna blow your brains out and blow up your house. And this was the last straw for him. He said that he sat down at his kitchen table and he trembled. He said he was overcome with fear and paralyzed. He'd already received death threats, hate mail. They said they were going to kill his wife and newborn daughter. But this was it. And he decided to leave Montgomery and, and he was going to leave the movement altogether. It was over. He just sat there and he wept. But that night, sitting at that table, he said, in his, one of his um, sermons, he said, he heard a second voice. And this voice was an inner voice. And he said, this was the voice of God. And he said, stand up for righteousness. Stand up for justice. Stand up for truth. And lo, I will be with you. I will never leave you. No, never alone. No, never alone. And he was filled with courage. This was the, the defining moment in his entire life. The Hebrew word for Holy Spirit is this, this word ruach. It's actually ruach. It's translated Holy Spirit, but it also can be translated as courage. It's no accident. The Holy Spirit comes and, and gives us courage that doesn't exist within ourselves. Listen to this passage and Think about the word that stands out the most. What is Paul trying to communicate to the Corinthians in this passage? Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion. Oh, that's a title. The Father of compassion. And the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all of our troubles so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves receive from God. For just as we share abundantly in the sufferings of Christ, so also our comfort abounds through Christ. Any words stand out? <laughs> he repeats comfort over and over and over. The Father of compassion comforts us. And Martin Luther King Jr. is going to need it. He had a lot of trouble after this. Two days later, he gets home and they firebombed his house. His wife and his daughter are on the road. He needed comfort. He was afraid again. Twelve years later, he's assassinated. Things didn't just go super easy for him. He still had worry. He still had fear. But he also had something else in his life. Courage. He had this brand new companion. Comfort. Peace. And how do we get that? How does that come to us? I think this is one thing that I've been um, really trying to lean into with God. I've never had anxiety in my whole life. <laughs> I was the least anxious kid you can imagine. But in the last couple of years, this is something definitely that has crept into my life. There's so many things outside of my control. And so there's this new companion, this unwelcome presence of just feeling like, oh, 
out of control, this feeling in your gut. You guys know that feeling? This feeling where things should be just incredible in your life. Circumstances are suddenly fine, but you just can't shake it. And there's no tricks or tips for how to just instantly be over this. There's no like quick answers or a simple sermon and oh, leave here free. It doesn't work like that. There's no prayer and suddenly all the chains are broken and suddenly you're free for life. But there are faithful patterns. Faithful patterns of life and new understandings that can cultivate a life with less anxiety. This is the promise of Scripture. Jesus said, abide in me and you'll bear much fruit. It's this, it's this pattern that we're going to be looking at this morning. So let's get into this. The passage, it's really intense. But before we get into it, you have to understand. So there's a genre in Scripture called apocalyptic literature. Do you guys know what that is? The book of Revelation. You read it and it's not meant to be taken literally. Jesus doesn't literally have a sword coming out of his mouth. It's apocalyptic literature, so there's imagery. And, and in this one section of the book of Mark, it's called the Little Apocalypse. It's the only time outside of Revelation, so we're going to read the Little Apocalypse now. It's not meant to be taken completely literally. It's imagery. And, um, and so we're going to get into that. So it's translated differently. So if you have your Bibles, turn to Mark 13. For those of you at home, turn to Mark 13. Um, otherwise, it'll be on the screen. Let's get into this. As Jesus was leaving the temple, one of his disciples said to him, Look, teacher, what massive stones, what magnificent buildings. They're walking away from the temple. And one of the guys looks back and was like, Oh, look at this building. Okay, the temple is 20 stories tall. Look at this thing. This is when most buildings were like way smaller than the roof of this building. 20 stories tall. This thing would stretch from here to the bridge. It was meant for a million people. This building is beyond massive. And they're leaving it. And the disciples are like, Jesus, look. And, and a lot of the, the stones at the very bottom, like the whole f like first layers, were 40 feet long. So from like me to the back wall long. And these things weighed a million pounds. Massive. Beyond massive building. This is the second temple. King Nebuchadnezzar destroyed the first, and so they built this one to never be destroyed. This was a permanent fixture forever. It was made to never be destroyed, so they built it to crazy specs. It had stood for 600 years. But here's what Jesus says. Do you see all these great buildings, replied Jesus? No one stone will be left on another. Everyone will be thrown down. Can you imagine what the disciples are thinking? It's not even possible. As if, Jesus. What a prediction. Now he's going to explain when this is going to happen. He says, As Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives, all opposite the temple, Peter, James, John, and Andrew asked him privately, Tell us, when will these things happen? And what will the sign that they're about to be fulfilled? He was sitting on the Mount of Olives. So imagine him sitting on this mountain. They're looking down on the temple. And this is called the Olivet Discourse. It's a really interesting passage. Jesus says to them, Watch out that no one deceives you. Many will come in my name claiming I am he and will deceive many. This happened. When you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places and famines. These are the beginning of birth pains. You must be on your guard. You will be handed over to the local councils and flogged in the synagogues. <laughs> These poor disciples. He's saying... You guys are about to be flogged. Are you ready for this? Imagine that. Remember the passion of the Christ. 40 lashings minus one. He's telling the disciples, this is going to be you. This would be horrible for them to hear. 
On account of me, you will stand before governors and kings as witnesses to them, and the gospel must first be preached to all nations. Whenever you are arrested and be brought to trial, do not worry beforehand about what to say. Just say whatever is given to you at the time, for it is not you speaking, but the Holy Spirit. Brother will betray brother to death, and a father his child. Children will rebel against their parents and have them put to death. Everyone will hate you because of me, but the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. Okay. And this is where it gets crazy. He says, you will see the abomination that causes desolation. Doesn't that sound like a cool wrestler name? (laughs) Standing where it does not belong. Let the reader understand, then those who who are in Judea flee to the mountains. What in the world is the abomination that causes desolation? Theologians have gone back and forth on this so many times. But there's some consensus that he's quoting Daniel 11.31. This is when Daniel foretold the first destruction of the temple. An army came and invaded it and took it over. Jesus is saying that an army is coming to destroy this temple. And, And Luke records this later. He says, when you see Jerusalem being surrounded by armies, you will know that its desolation is near. This is exactly what happened. This is the most disgusting chapter apart um, from what happened in Nazi Germany to the Jewish nation. What happened was the zealots took over the temple. These are Jewish, sort of like um, freedom fighters. These are terrorists that are Jews, and they wanted to bring Rome down. And what happened was, is that the Romans came in under Florus, and they stole a bunch of silver and left, and the zealots said, here's our chance. They went to Jerusalem and rioted and destroyed the Roman army and went back to the temple and celebrated. But Rome retaliated. Titus, who was the ruler, brought in 30,000 soldiers and did the most cruel thing imaginable. He waited till Passover. A million Jews entered the temple. He sealed it off. And a million people started to slowly die. They said it was the most horrible scene. We won't go into much detail. Historian Josephus recorded that they stacked the dead like wood. A million Jews died stuck in this temple. And all of the Roman soldiers were so eager to get the spoils because the Jews stored all the gold in the temple. It was the safest place. And Titus said, don't do it. Like he wanted the temple for his military headquarters. But they went in and they they were trying to find the gold and they lit the temple on fire. And what happened was the gold burned so hot that it that it just it turned into liquid and it poured between all the stones. And so this army took pry bars and pried the whole thing apart. Thirty thousand men destroyed the temple and left not one stone on another. This was just 40 years after Jesus said it would happen. He knows everything. He knew about this chapter in Jewish history. He knew about the temple. Jesus knows everything. He told Peter, he said, you're going to betray me three times before a rooster crows. How? He told Judas, he says, the one who betrays me is putting his hand right now, dipping it in the water, and it's Judas. Jesus said, they're going to kill me in Jerusalem. They're going to crucify me. Three days later, I'm going to rise. He's always right. He never is wrong. He knows the future. And this is why Jesus has perfect peace. Have you ever thought about that? He has perfect peace because he sees the whole thing. There's not a single surprise to him. Nothing shocks him. Nothing surprises him. Nothing in your life or my life comes out of the blue. This is why he's the prince of peace. And he offers us something incredible. Listen to this. He says, peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. Have you ever thought about that? The one with perfect peace is offering us his own peace. I do not give as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. 
you know, let's just spend a moment and let's just, I want you to read that. I want us to just meditate on that for 30 seconds. I think the question is, is how do we receive that peace? Because we're all followers of Jesus, and, and we still don't have that peace. How does this work? Jesus says in Matthew 6, Therefore do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. What Jesus is saying here is absolutely mind-blowing. He said, tomorrow we'll worry about, did you catch that? Itself. It's a self. Tomorrow's not a person. How could it worry? See what he's saying? How? That makes no sense. It doesn't even make, it's not even good grammar. How does that make sense? He's using a literary device here called prosopopoeia. This is what it is. It's when you personify an inanimate object. Jesus is saying tomorrow is a person and that person will worry about it for you. And that person is me. That is incredible. He's saying, I will take care of your tomorrow. He's saying, I will personally be responsible for it. You can rest. I met this guy on Skid Row and uh, this guy was a really interesting guy. This was his business. For people living on the streets, it is a, 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 like there's a lot of just feeling of unrest and danger. And there's people constantly under physical threat and people always get robbed and it's just, you just need a rest. And for $20, you can go inside of that, under that blue tarp, there's a bed. And for $20, he will personally watch out for you for one day and he'll make you breakfast in the morning. And I said to him, I said, how can you promise somebody safety? And he says, oh, I got my ways. <laughs> he said, I will personally look out for you. Now imagine, this is what this passage is saying, that God is saying, I will do this for you, but it's not that guy, it's God himself. He's saying, let me worry about tomorrow for you. Incredible. I will personally take responsibility for it, but we just need to sort of let go of control. This feeling of having to constantly control everything in every circumstance and just say, okay, I'll do it. A few years ago, one of my um, very good friends, um, his house was flooding and, and I showed up and it was like, he had this huge wall around it of sandbags and there was pumps going and if those pumps failed, his house would just instantly flood. And so he was just, three days in, I had been gone, and he's just exhausted, and his wife was very pregnant, and she was exhausted, and they were done. And so I said, okay, I'll help. And so we started helping, and at about like 11 o'clock at night, he was just done. He was completely depleted, and he's like, I can't lose my house. What's going to happen here? And I looked at him, and I said, go to bed. I will watch the pumps. From now on, I am in charge until the morning. And he's like, I can't do that. This is not your house. This is not your responsibility. And I said, make it my responsibility. I said, let me do it. <laughs> and he's like, okay. He said, you're in charge. And I said, I promise you I won't leave. I promise you I won't fall asleep. This is mine. And he went to bed. And he knew that he could sleep because somebody else was now responsible. He surrendered it. The thing that was causing him the most stress, he actually gave to me. And this is what Jesus is saying. What is giving you the most stress? Give it to me and I will now be responsible for it. But how do we do this? Like, How do I surrender my fears? How do I actually do this day to day, moment by moment? 
Peter says, humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. Cast your anxiety on him because he cares for you. This is an intentional surrender. It's actually naming the thing that's causing you fear and saying, you be responsible for it now. My children, I'm worried about them. You be responsible. This diagnosis, my spouse, my future, this pregnancy, this marriage, you be responsible for it now. You take it. You be responsible. He's saying, I want to. Peter's saying he has a mighty hand. This isn't being negligent. This is being faithful. We've been taught that to ask for help is somehow weak or negative. Peter's saying, no, no, no. This is how you humble yourself. If you want to be a follower of Jesus, it's a surrender and a trust. Dallas Willard puts it this way. Once we embrace the reality of God's love and care for us, his care, we see that this present world is perfectly safe place for us to be. Because he says, my peace I give you. This is an active, every moment, casting my present anxiety upon him. It's naming it and saying, I trust you with it, Father. It's naming it. And this is a pattern of life that as we commune with him and as we spend time every day with him, we're just, we're releasing. We're saying, this is you. I trust you. You say that, you say that you'll look after my tomorrow. You promise me that you're, you will do this for me. And it's a daily thing. There was this fascinating new study that was just released that looks at brain function Um, And there's this part of the brain that scientists are starting to realize more and more about. It's called the anterior cingulate. And this is it. I'm no brain surgeon or expert in this by any means, but I was fascinated by this study. That's the anterior cingulate. And they found that in most of us, we have a depleted anterior cingulate, that it's, it's not functioning well in most Canadians. It's actually, I think it's in North Americans. And this is why. This is what has kind of happened, is that this front part of our brain, this is called, um, what is this, the frontal cortex. And this is your conscious thought. Unfortunately, it's also where you head a soccer ball, you know. So this is why soccer players are always like laying on the ground injured, and they don't know exactly why. They're just laying there. Um, But this is the frontal cortex. And so this, this is your conscious thought. This is you. This is your consciousness. But there's this thing at the back of your brain on your brain stem. And this guy... This is powerful. This is the amygdala. It's about the size of an almond, but it controls fear. And fear overrides the whole brain. If you're in fear, nothing else matters. If a snake came right here, I'm done. See you later. My amygdala is going to take over, and I got not one more word. Fear takes over. But this anterior cingulate, what it does is that it it acts as a buffer. It's the gatekeeper between the two. Our problem is that that's weak in us, most of us. I shouldn't generalize, but in many people. But in this study, they found something incredible. They found that this can be completely restored in us. In this study, they took people and they had them pray or meditate. This isn't a Christian study. For eight to ten minutes a day. For two months. And they found that the brain function in this part of the brain was increased by 50% in two months. 50%. So many of us have just gotten out of the practice of daily prayer where we cast our anxieties on him and say, I can't do this. Can you please take this? And he's like, thank you for trusting me. Can you please take this? Thank you for trusting me. We drive into work and we have anxiety and we just say, I'm I'm handing this over to you. It's a surrender. Can you take it? We get into a meeting or with a person that is challenging or a situation that's challenging, and all day long it's a surrender, surrender, surrender. And all of a sudden we're starting to see that we're cultivating a life where we do have less anxiety. But it's a surrender and a trust. So what what we're going to do now is is we're going to start the first step in this journey that will last the next two months and then hopefully the rest of our lives, where what we're going to do is we're going to surrender our anxieties and let go of control of them. 
We're going to take communion, and this is a powerful act of surrender. Jesus gave up his body on the cross. It was, he surrendered his body to the will of the Father because he trusted him. And he said, do the same. And we're going to do the same here. We're going to actually just trust the Father. And we're going to surrender our anxieties. And we're going to take communion together as a symbol of that surrender. And let me encourage you, this is not a one-moment thing. This is an every single day thing. This is a, a way of life, a rule of life. And it can change absolutely everything. Jesus says, my peace I give to you. But he also says, yoke yourself to me. My yoke is easy and my burden is light. This is a permanent attachment to the Father where I match his pace of life where I'm not just walking alone but I'm sharing my anxieties with him in fact I get to cast them on him this is God here we're talking about he can look after my future he can look after everything in your mind even death does not separate us from that at, at the core of who God is he says I will never leave you this is what he told Martin Luther King Jr. I will never leave you. This is the courage that he had. He said, lo, I will always be with you. Oh, praise Jesus. Um, let's spend um, some moments here and let's, let's actually cast our anxiety on him. Let's, let's name them and call them out to him right now. And as you're ready, we're going to do two songs, and I invite you to come forward and, and take communion during any of these songs. Go back to your seat and just thank him. What an invitation. Let me take care of it. Let tomorrow worry about itself. Would you pray with me? Jesus, you're just too good. Father, I pray that we would be a people that in increasing measure, God, would experience your peace in our lives. That our lives would be marked with surrender, God, that we don't have to, we don't have to bear these things. You invite us to cast them onto you, to give them to you. Thank you, Jesus, that you're the good shepherd. Thank you, God, that you don't ask us to take care of these things on our own. God, forgive us for when we've attempted to, God, when we've been too, too stubborn to just let go of that. Jesus, I pray that right now, by the power of your Holy Spirit, God, that you would just bring to mind things that we've been holding back from you. We love you, Jesus. Yeah, so I invite you to um, take communion when you're ready to just cast those things upon the Father who loves you very much. And you can do that on your own as you feel ready.
we cast our cares upon you because <clears throat> you care for us, Lord. That's what your word says. to the Lord even now if there's things that are uh, just troubling you things that are beyond what you're able to carry yourself just encourage you just to give it to the Lord cast your burdens upon the Lord because he cares for you be anxious about anything. Through prayer and supplication and with thanksgiving, make your request known to God. And the peace of God which surpasses understanding will guard your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. good to, uh, to just rest in the peace of God. It's really good. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. <clears throat> we do one more song together. Or do you want to go home? <laughs> Let's do one more song, shall we, together? And uh, thanks, Joel, for sharing that word today. It was really important. I know I was t talking to Joel about it last week, and the, yeah, there are there literally have been times in my own life where I've literally had to hang on to God, like minute by minute. I was so troubled in my mind and heart with things that were too deep to carry and uh, I literally have had to learn how to take every thought captive and make it obedient to Christ and it, it it's really hard in those times and some of us know what that feels to like to be like that it's really difficult mm. but um, that's a great encouragement Joel yeah. to us today to keep pushing into the Lord. Yeah, thanks, Gabe. Uh, we're going to do one more. Um, as soon as we're done, we always have soup together, right? You guys know that that's what we do here? Um, so yeah, grab your soup at the back. And, uh, and there's, a, there's a little box there where you can put your money in, or Lucas will be at the back there to take uh, cards or whatever. You can also give that way if you don't do that. Um, 
Yeah, and at one o'clock today, we're having a memorial for Doris, and you're all welcome to stay for that. Um, it's just a great way to honor her. So that's going to be at one o'clock. Um, but yeah, you're welcome to all stay for soup, and um, we would love to visit as long as you can. Although we'll probably start to filter out of here at like 12:30, so we can be nice and clean uh, in here for her memorial. So have a wonderful time. We sure love being with you guys. Take it home.
Mm-hmm.